Hey guys, my name is Boris. I'm a physician assistant and today's video is going to be about money. So the last video I posted called physician assistant versus MD doctor, which one gets rich the fastest did pretty well. People seem to like these money topics and it's definitely something that I'm very passionate about personal finance. And uh, I mean, we do what we do because we're passionate about the work. We want to be healers. We want to be medical providers. We love medicine. But of course, money makes the world go around. So you have to have money in order to provide for your lifestyle, your family, you know, keep a roof over your head, put food in your mouth. If you have kids, put food in their mouths, take care of your pets, take care of your kids, take care of your parents, take care of your friends, do what you gotta do. Money makes the world go around. So it would actually be irresponsible to think about a career without thinking about how much the career pays and if you'll be able to provide the kind of lifestyle that you truly see yourself wanting to do for you and your family, uh, when you're considering a career, right? So people watch this channel for information on how to become a physician assistant, on living the life of a physician assistant, about medicine, about health. So if you're passionate about these things, I think that money plays into a lot of these things. And so let's go. The topic of this video is living on a average physician assistant salary in 2022, which according to the uh, AAPA annual salary report, is $115,000 per year. Now that is average, that's 50th percentile across all specialties, across all experience levels. So if you're working as a physician assistant, you know that your salary, you know, year one, just after school, usually is a whole lot lower than it might be after year even two, especially after year five. And especially after you've been practicing in the same specialty for five, 10 years, you've built up a base of patients. You're much more efficient at your job. You're much more knowledgeable. You're, uh, you don't have to bother your supervising physicians as much. You're much more independent. You're much more profitable. So usually salaries tend to go up and sometimes way up as you get more experienced. But that being said, uh, the average salary is still about $115,000 according to the salary report. So that is what I'm going to go off of when I make this video. So I'm just going to share my screen and we'll take it from here. Okay. So check this out. So first off, I wanted to show you the, uh, the AAPA salary report. If you're an AAPA member, you have access to this thing uh, and any contract as a physician assistant should include membership to AAPA. They should pay for this thing. So when you're negotiating for a salary, it's the most useful. Also, if you're thinking about changing specialties, thinking about living in a different part of the country, just to see if you're paid fairly, just to help you negotiate, uh, the AAPA annual salary report is a tremendously important tool. So using this tool, we see right here, um, nationwide in 2022, we have, oops, we have 50th percentile, which is average, $115,000. 25th percentile, so bottom quarter, is about $102,000. 75th percentile, so top 25%, about $132,000. And then the people at the very top, the top 10%, uh, the 90th percentile is making about 157, so about close to 160 grand a year. Not too, too bad. Uh, and I think this is all compensation. Nope, never mind, scratch that. It's not all compensation, it's just salary. So if you see under here, uh, under nationwide, that salary under there is also nationwide bonus. So a lot of physician assistant contracts come with a base salary. You know, you make that no matter what. And they also come with a bonus structure. So if you happen to hit certain goals of productivity, you happen to bill, you know, above a certain threshold, you get a certain percentage of that. So basically, uh, I'm not going to give you an example, especially for my contract, but let's say, you know, I don't know, let's say they expect you to make $50,000 a month in billing. And then let's say, you know, anything over that, they'll give you like 10%, right? So let's say you make $60,000 a month for your practice that month, then you get 10% of that extra 10 grand, which is gonna be $1,000. So that's $1,000 that month that you made in bonus. That's usually how bonuses work. Uh, the proportions, of course, the numbers are totally fudged, totally case dependent, um, you know, specialty, primary care. Compensation works wildly differently in a lot of different factors. Well, I'm just giving you a good example of, you know, if you meet a threshold, you get a certain percentage of whatever you bill above that threshold. Um, and of course, I can go into way more detail about that, but that's just the basics of the bonus structure. Uh, so basically here we have, you know, 50th percentile average base salary was about 115,000. If you look just below that 50th percentile, so average um, bonus was $5,000 annually. 
So that means that the average physician assistant in 2022 made a total of $122,000, oh, sorry, $120,000 per year. These guys at the very, very top, $157,000 a year salary, about $24,000 a year bonus. So that actually puts them up to just below $180,000 a year, all things included. So that's actually quite good, isn't it? Especially for a physician assistant. That's very, very good. And then here, bringing up the rear, uh, these poor folks in the 10th percentile, uh, probably working in a, and assuming this is all uh, full-time, none of this is part-time. This is all assuming full-time work, so you know, 40, 50 hours a week or so. Uh, so these people working in probably one of the lower paid specialties, like pediatrics, tends to bring up the rear in most cases, unfortunately. You know, you're taking care of kids, it's super important, but for whatever reason, pediatrics uh, does not make a whole lot of money a lot of times. Same with primary care, you know, that's why I'm in it right now. I definitely feel that, and uh, I'm also getting out, actually. More to come on that. I don't think I've told anybody on YouTube, but yeah, I'm actually changing specialties pretty shortly. But more to come on that later. So basically, these people at the bottom 10%, uh, bottom 10th percentile here make about 92 grand a year plus you know this minimal bonus of like 700 bucks so even the, the physician assistants working full-time kind of at the bottom of the ladder are still making you know over 90 93 94 thousand dollars a year so not too too bad honestly not a bad career when the bottom 10 percent is making just over 90 grand you know um so yeah and these are a lot out of times probably just like new grads maybe uh they're doing fellowships where the pay is quite low uh this kind of a thing so yeah, so that's the average. So this video is going to be on living on the average salary, which is $115,000 a year plus the bonus, making it about $120,000 a year. How easy is it to live on $120,000 a year as a physician assistant? Okay, so that is what we are going to do. I'm going to use actually just kind of an average US city. So I'm living in Syracuse, New York currently. Uh, may not be here forever. Also, you heard it here first. I might be moving. Uh, Raleigh, North Carolina might be calling my name or possibly Tampa, Florida or possibly Cleveland, Ohio. Those are my top three right now. Uh, kind of heavily leading towards Raleigh, but we'll see what happens. Either way, so Syracuse is a pretty low to average cost of living city. Uh, this website right here, livingcost.org, um, they have a lot of really good information. So for instance, you know, the average price of lunch, the average price of dinner, the average price of a cappuccino, uh, the average price of an apartment, all this I see as pretty accurate, having lived here. Um, some things are not super accurate, but there are total calculations here for an actual monthly budget, I think, are total dog crap. Like, uh, they think that your transportation is going to cost 60 bucks a month. How? How? Even if you have an electric car, like, no way. Absolutely not. What are you doing? Riding a scooter to work or, like, a unicycle or something? Absolutely not. Not possible. And so they're... Uh, Average monthly salary here is 28 grand. I think that's actually pretty accurate. That's about 50 grand a year, uh, 50, 55, 60 grand a year. So that's pretty accurate for a single person. But I think that this whole budget of 17, 1800 bucks a month is absolutely impossible, even in Syracuse. Uh, so we're actually gonna build our own budget, if you can see my screen, but we'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, also here, Syracuse cost of living, it's uh, about 11% lower than the national average, which is, I'd say probably pretty accurate. Some places are much more expensive. Some places are much less expensive. Housing um, kind of is less expensive if you buy a house. Housing prices here are quite low. However, rent prices are not that low and taxes are pretty high. So uh, either way, I'm just saying I'm using Syracuse as my experience because I've been living here the last few years. So I know what it costs to live here. Okay, so that is what we're doing with that. Um, okay, so first things first, let's figure out and just like my last money video, I'm going to do this all in real time so you can see my thought process and I'm going to build the spreadsheet in real time. In case you need help building your own budget spreadsheet, I'm going to show you exactly how I do that, how I do uh, the calculations, the totals, and exactly how you can stay on budget because it's tremendously important that you do manage your money well and not succumb to lifestyle creep. Uh, so first things first, you need to figure out how much you're making per month, right? 120, right? That's what we said, $120,000 total between salary and bonus. Let's say you're the uh, national average physician assistant. So uh, we're going to do 120, if you see that, $120,000 per year. Now, the problem with this is most people are paid on a uh, bi-weekly basis, so every two weeks, which means twice a year, you actually get an extra paycheck, 
which, you know, if you're smart, you just kind of live on two paychecks a month. And then those extra ones you use as a travel budget, as a boost in your savings, X, Y, and Z, whatever you want to do. But uh, for the purposes of this video, I think it's a lot easier instead of calculating biweekly, like most people are paid, I think it would actually be much more beneficial to, uh, con to um, what am I trying to say? Brain freeze. Sorry, it's 4.58 uh, p.m. and I've worked a very long day. Um, monthly. That's the word I'm looking for. It's much more beneficial for the purposes of this video to just calculate monthly pay, even though that's not what most people experience. Okay. So monthly pay, if you can use this calculator right here, and this is again in Syracuse, New York, calculated with the New York state taxes, which are quite absurdly high. Um, I personally don't pay any local taxes because I live in the city, but like if you live in a suburb, your taxes will be even higher. Uh, but this is just, you know, calculated based on living in the city of Syracuse, making $120,000 a year, your estimated monthly take-home pay is $6,500 a month. Here's how this is calculated. Here's your tax bill, right? FICA, state, um, federal taxes. Plus, I also, this is one big assumption here, but this is something you should obviously do. Uh, I assumed a pre-tax deduction of 5% because most contracts will have a IRA, a retirement fund with match, and usually you have to put in 5% of your take-home pay, um, or sorry, 5% of your pre-tax pay in order to get that match. So it's actually really stupid not to do that because it's just a lot of free money that you're leaving on the table for your retirement. So I'm assuming that you're a physician assistant. If you're a physician assistant, you're pretty smart. And if you're pretty smart, you better be putting away 5% of your pre-tax salary in your company's 401k because you want to get that match and you want to save for retirement because you don't want to be old and poor. Uh, you want to be old and rich, at least I do. Anyway, so those are my assumptions that you're living in Syracuse, New York with the crazy state taxes that we pay, uh, plus the federal tax rate of whatever it may be here, plus you're putting away 5% of your pre-tax income into a 401k. These are my assumptions. With these assumptions in place, you see that your monthly take-home pay is about $6,500 per month. Pretty damn good, I would say, especially in this area. So knowing that, $6,500 a month, let's go to our sample budget in our total monthly money, then is going to be $6,500 per month, okay? Uh, I'm assuming you're not working any part-time jobs. I'm assuming you don't have like an annuity. You don't have any other income of any sort. I know a lot of people do, but we're just assuming that you're living on this national average of $120,000 a year, uh, which equates to after um, Syracuse taxes and, uh, and national taxes, federal taxes, and also putting away 5% of your pre-tax income into a 401k equates to about $6,500 a month. Okay. Now, these are all the line items on my personal budget, and I think it's pretty comprehensive. Obviously, if you got kids, you got daycare, you got other expenses, you know, you might have line items that are different from mine, but I'm going to do this pretty basic. I think I cover what most people spend their money on, at the very least, most single people like myself, all right? Um, oh, and actually, that actually reminds me. So here, I am doing this as a single person. You see marital status single. Uh, if you click married, your tax rate changes, of course. Uh, and then other things get a little bit more complicated. You might have your spouse's income in there. So <clears throat> it's just much easier to calculate these things and live in general as a single person. You know, um, people who are married obviously get tax benefits and things are different and their spouse might make money. So that might make your household budget totally different. Also probably changes your household expenses. So I'm going to say as a single person, this is much, much easier. Not to talk down to married people, I'm sure sooner or later I'm going to, you know, give in and join the ranks of you guys sometime down the line, but that is not today or anytime soon. Uh, but anyway, so another assumption I forgot is we're doing this as a single person making 120 grand, which basically means the government's going to be like, oh yeah, give me that money because we're going to tax the from crap out of you, which, uh, yeah, you can obviously tell how I feel about that. Okay, so... All those assumptions aside, we are going to say monthly income of $6,500 a month. Now, when you're making your budget, uh, I say savings and sinking funds, those should be the last things you calculate because you need to know how much you're actually living off of first. So the very first thing I'm going to put in here is mortgage or rent, right? So that website that I just showed you, they said that the average rent is like a thousand bucks for a one bedroom. 
that's kind of on the low side. You're not going to live in a great part of town. Uh, my mortgage is about $1,300 a month, plus I pay extra, obviously, towards principal. So let's just say for $1,500 a month, you can definitely have a decent apartment or mortgage in a decent part of town where you're safe, right? Uh, you're a professional, you make good money, you can definitely afford to live in a safe area, and you should. This is also assuming you don't have roommates, you're living like an adult, you know? Uh, so yeah, I'm gonna say $1,500 a month on rent. Also, this website said something about utilities being like, where the heck did it say? Oh, that's rent and utilities for a thousand bucks. Yeah, no way, fat chance. There's absolutely no way. <clears throat> I'm gonna say utilities realistically for a small house even is like maybe about 200 bucks a month, maybe. And that's if you keep it pretty cool in the winter and pretty uh, warm in the summer. So yeah, I'm gonna say 200 minimum for utilities. Uh, food, depending on how extravagant your budget is, whether you shop at Aldi's or whether you shop at Wegmans, you know, um, or Costco. For food, I think for a single person, especially in 2022 with inflation as crazy as it is, I think 400 is kind of a decent amount. If you eat like canned tuna, canned beans, and like freaking canned fruit, never buy anything raw, never buy anything, uh, never buy anything fresh, never really get good quality food. Yeah, you could probably do it for like two to 300 bucks a month, but you're just, I don't know. That's a very unsatisfying way to eat. You're not gonna be healthy. I think 400 is a pretty decent amount, kind of low to normal for spending on healthy food for one person every single month. Uh, going out, entertainment, again, as a single person, kind of important. Uh, I'm going to say a bare minimum of like 200, but I mean, think about it. You take one person out to dinner, even if it's not an expensive dinner, you get a glass of wine, an appetizer, and like an entree each, you're going to be out 70 bucks, even in Syracuse. Easy. You know, you do that three or four times a month, suddenly that's like three, $350. So I'm going to say people might like laugh at this figure, but if you actually calculate your money and figure out how much you're actually living off of, how much you actually spend on going out at the bars, at the restaurants, whatever you may do, buying lunches, buying coffee in the morning, buying breakfast, I'm thinking you probably spend at least 300, realistically probably closer to 400. But let's say you're frugal, let's say you're going out, entertainment budget is like 300 a month, which is actually pretty sparse, honestly. Uh, health, let's say you have a gym membership, maybe you do some sort of a dance class, maybe you do some sort of a curricular extracurricular activity that's active. Maybe you have some memberships. Maybe you have a personal trainer. Uh, I personally pay for two gym memberships and a masseuse. I get a, a deep tissue massage every month. So somebody on average on their health should at the very least probably spend about a hundred bucks a month. I'm going to say, you know, a massage here and there, a gym membership, uh, supplements, whatever it is. You know, if this is totally inaccurate for you, cool, then you're a hundred dollars richer per month than I am. Uh, but my health budget is actually quite a bit higher than this because I really care about my health. Uh, miscellaneous, you should always have a little wiggle room. I'm going to say 200 bucks. You never know when you get a freaking parking ticket. You have to buy something random. You know, I'm going to say just a little wiggle room every month. Uh, for gas and car expenses, it, this wildly varies on if you have a car payment or not. I'm lucky enough to where I do not. Granted, my car is 200,000 miles on it and it's a total piece of crap. So I might very well have a car payment soon. Uh, but let's just assume you do not. And then with gas as high as it is, unless you have like a Tesla or something, I'm going to say like my, my expense, uh, my budget here is about $300 a month. If it's only gas, I usually never hit that unless I take road trips, but with insurance, with random expenses, with changing your oil, you know, tires, stuff comes up, little repairs here and there. I think 300 bucks a month without a car payment is actually quite realistic. Phone bill. Uh, I think my phone bill is like 120 bucks. Uh, but I get a veteran's discount and I pay for actually three lines. So I think a hundred bucks is probably pretty average for a phone bill. Uh, generosity, charity, you should definitely, I mean, I'm not like a big Bible thumper or anything. I'm actually Jewish, but I think the tithe, you know, a 10th of your take home pay is a very respectable amount to give. Now, granted with taxes as high as they are, and so many of our taxes going to philanthropic, uh, things, uh, maybe that tithe is kind of an old number. A tenth of your income is might be, I don't know, probably a little bit on the high side, but still it makes you feel way better spending money on yourself and taking nice vacations and going out to a nice dinner when you know that 10% of your income, you're actually giving to other people. So maybe that 
would be just leaving a fat tip at a restaurant. I consider that generosity, charity. Um, maybe you pay for uh, like a monthly contribution to charities that you believe in, which I definitely do. Um, a few of them actually, a few different things. My monthly donations are spread across three different charities that I very, very, very strongly believe in. New York Bully Crew, Brothers for Life, and Vera House uh, are fantastic charities and definitely causes that I very, very strongly believe in and want to champion. So of course I put my money where my mouth is and I, you know, I give money every single month without even thinking about it to those charities. Um, and also I leave a little wiggle room in the generosity charity budget just to, like I said, give a really big tip. Uh, like if your waiter is obviously having a bad day, give them a freaking hundred percent tip, give them like 20 bucks, give them 50 bucks, whatever you spent on the meal, you know, on your overpriced food, give that to an actual person. You know, they don't make that much money. They're obviously, you know, in some sort of transition part of their life if they're waiting tables. So freaking give them some money. All right. Like you don't need it. Give it to them. Uh, and it just makes you feel better as a human being that you're contributing every single month. And also, uh, Dave Ramsey says this, the money guy, he says that generous people are just more attractive. And it, I don't know if that's necessarily true, like directly, but it just, it makes you just feel better about life when you're contributing to other people instead of just me, 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 me. What can I buy? What can I eat? What can I wear? What can I just give myself? It's just freaking like, it's just better to make sure that it's a line item on your budget to give to other people. Okay. So I'm going to say, I don't know, maybe a little less than 10%, let's say 500 bucks, right? Let's say 500 bucks a month you are giving to other people. If you're not, I don't know, um, a little bit of judgment passed your way. If you're making this kind of money, you should freaking give some of it away. Okay. Okay. Uh, all right. Student loans. So I'm lucky enough to where I only have one student loan left at this point. Uh, and it's only a hundred bucks a month and it's interest free. So mine is a hundred bucks a month. More than likely, if you're a new physician assistant or even not so new, more than likely you got, you know, at least 300, usually 500 or more a month coming out for student loans. So since this video is for most people, not for me, I'm going to say um, 400 a month on student loans because that's actually quite realistic and might even be on the low side, depending on how much you owe. Um, yeah. All right. So now. Before we do our savings and our sinking funds, let's do this. So right now, we are going to do how much we have left at the end of the month. So this is going to be equals, and pay attention if you wanna build one of these yourself, equals this total monthly money minus, open parenthesis, um, all of this, select all of these, Close parenthesis. What is happening? Uh, why is this not working? Hmm. Equals D3 minus. Oh, that's why. Okay. So D3 or total monthly money minus the sum of all those values. There we go, now we got a number. Okay, so basically what this is, is our total monthly money minus all these expenses that we came up with. Of course, if you have other expenses, if you have you know, childcare, like I said, could be super expensive. You got a car payment, your student loan is different, or you don't have student loans, You know, whatever expenses you have to add or subtract, you do all of that, you take it away from your total monthly money, and that gives you $2,500 total um, left over. So that means that is going to be what you're going to do savings and or sinking funds and or adjust some of these as needed. So let's say, you know, you want to save 2000 bucks a month and let's say you want to uh, put $500 a month into sinking funds. Sinking funds are just stuff that you're uh, saving for. Savings is to like build up your savings, your emergency fund. Uh, maybe you're saving for a house, whatever that may be. So for instance, like my sinking funds are for a phone because I have an old iPhone 10 that's about to die um, for my computer because I have this ancient computer I've been using since freaking before PA school that's about to die. Uh, so I'm just putting money away patiently every single month, suffering with these crappy devices until I have enough saved in those sinking funds in order to replace the devices. You know, I don't just swipe my credit card and buy crap and pay it off later. That's a stupid way to go. I contribute every month into my sinking funds and patiently wait until I have enough to buy what I want to buy. All right, so that's basically your savings for whatever you're saving for. Your savings in general is you got to pay yourself first 
Um, even on top of the 401k contribution that we're making, you got to pay yourself first, build your fortune, build your emergency fund. So that way, when your roof caves in, you get in a car accident, you get fired, you know, you got to live on something for a while, you have money and it's more of an inconvenience than a tragedy, uh, whatever it is that happened to you, right? So always, always save money, always, always save up for things that you're doing. And so now you see here at the end, we're at zero, we're zeroed out, right? So every single dollar we make is accounted for. Uh, and, you know, I think this is a pretty respectable budget. If, you know, let's say you go out a lot, you know, maybe your entertainment budget is going to be like 500 a month, which seems laughable, but honestly, try calculating how much you spend on restaurants, bars, coffee, and breakfast and lunches every month. I bet you it's actually probably in excess of $500 a month if you make decent money, right? Uh, and then of course, because that's now 500, now we're 200 in the hole. So now savings is probably going to be less, right? 1800. So that's how that works. Anyway, guys, uh, so this turned into a budgeting exercise, but basically the title of this video was living on an average physician assistant salary in 2022, which is $120,000 a year uh, in a pretty average, kind of low to average cost of living city. Of course, in Manhattan, this would be a whole different beast. Your, uh, your mortgage or rent would be like $3,500, $4,000, which basically leaves you almost nothing for anything else. Uh, so in one of those cities, you know, uh, $120,000 just simply does not go a long way. In a city like Syracuse, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, Detroit, you know, places that nobody kind of wants to live, <laughs> the unspoken truth, uh, you know, $120,000 a year is actually a very, very good salary. As you can tell, you can live very, very well and still have tons of money left over to save and invest and do everything that you're going to do, right? So that's the video, guys. Let me know what you think, and I'll see you in the next video.